Welcome to the second lecture on the gromov hausdorff propinquity. In this lecture, we wish to offer a possible answer to the question what could we mean by two non-commutative spaces being close to each other. We are interested in the metric approach. Metrics are natural to consider in physics and geometry, yet while they induce a topology on the underlying space, we can continuously vary metrics or the topology can change drastically, allowing us to ask when a space with non-discrete topology is for instance the limit of finite metric spaces. In non-commutative geometry, this would enable us to ask when something like a quantum torus is the limit of finite dimensional sister algebras, and in particular by what is referred to in physics as fuzzy tori. In other words, metric approximations are very flexible, compatible with changes of topologies, and allow us to discuss finite dimensional approximations. Our approach to this problem involves generalizing the gromov hausdorff distance between two compact metric spaces. The gromov hausdorff distance between two compact metric spaces X and Y is given as the infimum over all possible compact metric spaces Z and all possible isometric embeddings of X and Y in Z of the Hausdorff distance between these isometric copies of X and the isometric copy of Y. Remarkably, this construction leads to a complete distance up to full isometry between compact metric spaces. Among many fascinating results about this metric, which is used in Riemannian geometry or geometry group theory, Gromov obtained a characterization of compact classes of compact metric spaces. We will see in this lecture how to generalize this gromov hausdorff distance to non-commutative geometry and see how to generalize such a result as Gromov compactness theorem to our new metric. As discussed in our previous lecture, we will work on the category of quantum compact metric spaces. A pair AL is a compact quantum metric space when A is a unital C-star algebra and L is a seminorm defined on a dense subspace of the self adjoint part of our sister algebra A with the following properties. The zero set of the semi norm L exactly is the self adjoint multiple of the unit of the sister algebra. Most importantly, the weak star topology on the state space of our sister algebra A is metrized by the Monge Kantorovich metric induced by the semi norm L on the state space by setting for any state phi m psi that the Monge Kantorovich metric between phi m psi is a supremum of the absolute value of phi minus psi over the unit ball for the semi-norm L. We also connect the multiplicative structure of our sister algebra with our semi-norm L by requiring that L satisfies the form of the Leibniz inequality. Specifically, we require that if A and B are in the domain of L, then L of the real part of the product of A and B and L of the imaginary part of the product of A and B are both bounded above by an expression that only depends on the norm and the L seminorm of A and B. The standard expression is given by the norm of A times L of B plus the norm of B times L of A, which is, of course, the usual Leibniz rule. But we can work with a more general form of the Leibniz identity to accommodate certain interesting examples. We also require that the closed unit ball for our semi-norm L is actually closed in norm in the sister algebra. We call a semi-norm that satisfies all these properties an L semi-norm for Lipschitz. In particular, if A is a sister algebra of complex valued continuous functions on a compact metric space and L is the associated Lipschitz semi-norm, then C of X L is an example of a quantum compact metric space. Other examples include quantum tori, AF algebras, Budle spheres, curve quantum tori, hyperbolic group sister algebras, nilpotent group sister algebras, and many more. Compact quantum metric spaces are objects of a category. A Lipschitz morphism pi from a quantum compact metric space A L of A to another compact quantum metric space B L of B is a unital star morphism from A to B such that one of the following equivalent condition holds and therefore all of them hold. 
the first condition is the exist k so that l of b composed with pi is less or equal than k times l of a. That is to say, pi as a linear map is continuous from the domain of l of a to the domain of l of b and that with the respective seminorms l of a and l of b. The second condition says there exists a case so that for all state phi m psi of b, the Morse contour of each distance induced on the state space of a by l of a between phi composed with pi and psi composed with pi is less or equal than k times the Morse contour of each distance of the state space of b induced by l of b between phi and psi. In that case, we are saying that the dual map of pi is indeed a Lipschitz map from the state space of B and that with its morse kantorovich metric to the state space of A with its morse kantorovich metric. The third condition simply states that pi maps the domain of the L seminorm L of A inside the domain of the L seminorm L of B. It is easy to check, of course, that this definition of a Lipschitz morphism provides arrows for a category on the class of objects given by the compact corner metric spaces. Within the category of compact corner metric spaces, there lies a subcategory where the arrows are restricted to being quantum isometries. Inspired by Maxchen's extension theorem for real valued Lipschitz function on metric spaces, Riffel introduced the notion of a quantum isometry, which was later refined to include the condition that quantum isometry should in particular be Lipschitz morphisms. A quantum isometry, pi, from a system a quantum isometry pi from a compact quantum metric space A L of A into onto. A quantum isometry pi from a compact quantum metric space A L of A onto a compact quantum metric space B L of B. A quantum isometry pi from a compact quantum metric space A L of A onto a compact quantum metric space B L of B is a star epimorphism such that the quotient seminorm of L of A pi pi is indeed given by L of B. Notably, the dual map of a quantum isometry pi is an actual isometry from the state space of the codomain of pi to the state space of the domain of pi with the state space endowed with the respective morse kantorovich metrics. It is important to stress that quantum isometries and more generally, oh yeah, Quantum isometries are of course easily checked to be Lipschitz morphisms. It is important to stress that quantum isometries and more generally Lipschitz morphisms are in particular star morphisms. In particular, a full quantum isometry between two compact quantum metric spaces is actually a star isomorphism which is also an isometry for the L seminorms. This notion of full quantum isometry is for our purpose the right notion for two compact quantum metric spaces to be the same from the purpose of quantum metric geometry. We now generalize the construction of Edwards and Gromov to the non commutative setting. To define the Gromov Hausdorff distance between two compact metric spaces X and Y, we consider all possible isometric embeddings of X and Y into a third compact metric space Z. We now have the proper notions to make a non commutative version of such a diagram, which we call a tunnel. Given two compact quantum metric spaces A L of A and B L of B, a tunnel is given by a third compact quantum metric space D L of D, and two quantum isometries, one from D L of D onto A L of A, and one from D L of D onto B L of B. It is a typical picture in non-commutative geometry where, by contravariance, the arrows are flipped and we were able to generalize classical notions such as metrics and isometries to the non-commutative framework. Now, such a tunnel actually gives rise to a particular example of a gromov hausdorff isometric embedding. Indeed, if we consider the dual maps to the quantum isometries in our tunnel, they become actual isometries from, respectively, the state space of A with its morse kantorovich metric into the state space of D with its morse kantorovich metric, and similarly the state space of B with its morse kantorovich metric, 
and the state space of D with its Morse contour of H metric. However, this is a very specific type of Gromov-Hausdorff embedding. It is not a generic Gromov-Hausdorff embedding where we simply consider the state space of A and the state space of B as just some compact metric space endowed with these particular metrics coming from the L-semi norms. We specifically require, first of all, that we embed the state spaces into another state space. And second of all, the isometries that we use are very specific. They are the dual maps of star epimorphisms. Now, as we reviewed at the beginning of this lecture, the construction of the gram of Hausdorff distance involves associating a number using the Hausdorff distance to any gram of Hausdorff embedding. So similarly, we wish to associate a number, presumably using the Hausdorff distance again, to a tunnel. Such a number is called the extent of the tunnel. Again, let us fix two quantum compact metric spaces A L of A and B L of B, and let us consider an arbitrary compact metric space D L of D, and two quantum isometries, one from D to A and one from D to B. As we saw on the previous slide, there is an isometric embedding of the state space of A with its morse kontrovich metric as a subspace of the state space of D with its kontrovich metric. What we are going to do is take the Hausdorff distance for the morse kontrovich metric induced by LD on the state space of D between the entire state space of D and the isometric copy of the state space of A. We do the same thing with B. That is, we take the Hausdorff distance for the morse kontrovich metric induced on the state space of D by L of D of the whole of the state space of D with the isometric image of the state space of B given by the dual map of the quantum isometry from D to B. Now, this construction is somewhat different from the gram of Hausdorff construction, and we shall have to reconcile the two later on. Now, there is one more important point to stress. In the gromov hausdorff distance, we consider any possible isometric embedding in the definition of our metric. In non-commutative geometry, we have to account for the fact that we relaxed the so-called Leibniz condition in our definition of a compact metric space. While this gives us some freedom, it is important that all the tunnels that we invoke in our construction of our metric have the same Leibniz property as the two spaces we are taking the distance between. This restriction is essential to the proof that what we are going to define now is actually indeed a metric up to full quantum isometry. Thus, let's fix two quantum compact metric spaces A and B. The draw propinquity between A and B is given as the infimum of the set of the extent of all possible tunnels between A and B with a given choice of a Leibniz property. Now, it is always possible to prove that actually such a tunnel exists between any two quantum compact metric space. Since the extent is by construction a non-negative number, the dual propinquity is indeed the infimum of a subset of the real numbers which is at once non-empty and bounded below by zero. Thus, this is in fact a well-defined quantity. Naturally, we'd like to know what properties this quantity has. And it turns out that the draw propinquity, as we have just defined, is indeed a complete metric up to full quantum isometry on the class of compact quantum metric spaces, satisfying a given Leibniz relation. We stress that in particular, if the dual propinquity between two compact quantum metric spaces A L of A and B L of B is zero, then the C star algebras A and B must be star isomorphic. Completeness also offers the possibility of constructing certain C star algebras as limits of Cauchy sequences of compact metric spaces. Thus, it provides possible ways to prove existence of certain sister algebras with certain properties using a new idea from non-commutative metric geometry. Moreover, we can reconcile our construction with the original Edwards and Gromov construction, 
by observing that indeed, when restricted to the class of classical compact metric spaces, the draw propinquity induces the same topology as the topology of the gromov hausdorff distance. Thus, the dual propinquity is indeed a non-commutative analog of the gromov hausdorff distance, but adapted to non-commutative geometry. In particular, the topology of the dual propinquity indeed is a generalization of the topology of the gromov hausdorff distance from the class of compact metric spaces to the class of compact quantum metric spaces. Thus, for free, we get a lot of examples of convergence for our new dual propinquity metric, simply given by all the known examples of convergence in the gromov hausdorff distance. However, of course, our focus and our interest is on non-commutative convergences. The key ingredient in proving the fundamental properties of the propinquity is the observation that tunnels behave almost like morphisms. Let tau be a tunnel from a compact quantum metric space A L of A to a compact quantum metric space B L of B. That is, the given of a third compact quantum metric space D L of D and two quantum isometries, the quantum isometry pi sub A, which goes from D L of D onto A L of A, and a quantum isometry pi sub B, which goes from D L of D onto B L of B. We are going to define a set valued function from that tunnel going from A L of A to the power set of B. If A is in the domain of L sub A, and if L is greater or equal than L sub A applied to A, then we can set the target set of A for this given L associated to the given tunnel tau as the images by pi of B of all the elements in D, which are in the pre-image by pi of A of A, and whose L sub norm in D is less or equal than L. We thus define a set valued function, and we are now going to see that it behaves like a continuous Jordan Lee morphism. Moreover, we are also going to see that it is almost possible to compose tunnels, and it is in fact a fundamental observation in the proof of the triangular inequality for the propinquity. First, let's look at the Jordan Lee morphism properties. Keeping the notations we have just used, Let's see what it would mean for such a set valued function to be behaving in a sort of linear manner. If A and A prime are two elements in the domain of L sub A, and if L is a number greater or equal than the maximum of L sub A applied to A and L sub A applied to A prime, and if T is an arbitrary real number, then the sum of the target set of A for the real number L plus T times the target set of A prime for the number L is a subset of the target set of a plus t a prime for the number 1 plus absolute value of t times l. So for a fixed tunnel, the target sets behave like a set valued function which has some sort of linearity property. Similarly, it has a multiplicativity property. Let's recall that the Jordan product of two self adjoint elements in our sister algebra, which we here denote with a circle, is simply the real part of their product. If A and A prime are in the domain of L sub A, and if L is greater or equal than the maximum of L sub A applied to A and L sub A applied to A prime, then the set obtained by taking the Jordan product with any element from the target set of A for the number L with any element of the target set of A prime for the same number L is a subset of the target set of the Jordan product of A with A prime for some number which depends on the Leibniz condition that we have chosen for our tunnel. This is of course where the choice of a Leibniz property is very important. A similar identity holds for the Lie product, that is, for 1 over 2i times the commutator of a and a prime. We also have a continuity property. It says that if a is in the domain of the L seminorm a, and L is a number greater or equal than L sub a applied to a, then the supremum of the norm of every element in the target set of A for the number L is less or equal than the norm of A plus 2L times the extent of the tunnel. And of course, this is where the extent plays a fundamental role. Last, even though we are dealing with a set valid function, 
it's notable that it has a sort of point-like property, namely, it turns that target sets are never empty and are always compact. We there see that a tunnel gives rise to a set-valued function, which, in some sense, mimics the properties of a continuous Jordan Lie algebra morphism. It is more of a possible to almost compose two tunnels. If we give two tunnels, one from a quantum compact matrix space A L of A to a quantum compact matrix space B L of B, and another one from the same compact quantum matrix space B L of B to a third compact quantum matrix space E L of E, and if we are given an epsilon, it is possible, using the formulas highlighted here in blue, to define a tunnel from the compact quantum matrix space A L of A to the compact quantum matrix space E L of E. Now it does depend on epsilon, but what is important is that the extent of this new tunnel is less or equal than the extent of the first tunnel plus the extent of the second tunnel plus this error epsilon. So while we do not have an exact composition, since it is parameterized by this little epsilon here, we do have a lot of properties of tunnels that mimic properties of morphisms. These properties have many very important consequences. At the end of our first lecture on the gromov hausdorff propinquity, we propose the problem. For every natural number n, let's consider the C star algebra of Zn squared twisted by some 2 cycle rho n, where Zn is a quotient of Z by the subgroup nz. These C star algebras are generated canonically by two unitaries, which up to a star isomorphism, we can choose to be a shift matrix and a diagonal matrix whose entries are successive powers of some root of unity. Of course, this root of unity is connected to the choice of the two cycle rho n. Now, if we n let go to infinity, it is natural to ask if these twisted C star algebras of Zn square approach a quantum tori in some sense under a natural condition on the sequence of the two cycles rho n. Let's equip the two torus with a continuous length function. For each n, the Cartesian square of the group of nth root of unity naturally acts on the C star algebra of Zn square twisted by any two cycle, and this action is known as the dual action. It is also known to be ergodic. Thus, using the construction we've seen on our previous lecture, we can equip each of these twisted group C star algebras with a quantum metric. We were able to prove that if the roots of unity corresponding to the two cycles rho n converge to some unimodular complex numbers of the form exponential 2i pi theta, then indeed the propinquity between the twisted group C star algebra of Zn square for the two cycle rho n endowed with its quantum metric and the quantum torus endowed with again the quantum metric inherited from the dual action of the two torus on the quantum torus and the chosen length function, it converges to zero as n goes to infinity. This result is in fact a special case of a more general result about the continuity of quantum tori and the approximation of quantum tori by so-called fuzzy tori, which can be stated as such formally. Let L be a continuous length function on the detorus. Let G be a closed subgroup of the detorus, and sigma be a two cycle of the Pontryagin dual of G. First, note that there is an action of the compact abelian group G on the sista algebra of the Pontryagin dual of G twisted by the two cycle sigma. This action is called the dual action, and we will denote it by alpha. It is known that alpha is ergodic, that is, the fixed point C star subalgebra of the action alpha is given by the scalar multiple of the identity. Thus, we can define a quantum metric on the C star algebra of the Pontryagin dual of G twisted by the two cycle sigma by setting for all A in that C star algebra that L of A is the supremum of the norm of alpha G of A minus A divided by L of G, where G ranges over our closed subgroup, except the unit of the group. Now, 
refill proves that indeed this L is an L seminorm on the C star algebra, the Pontryagin dual of G twisted by the Tucker cycle sigma. We prove that if we apply this construction repeatedly to a sequence of closed subgroups of the torus, which converge to the torus for the Hausdorff distance induced by the chosen length function, and if sigma n is a sequence of two cycles of z to the d, converging pointwise to some sigma, which for each n induce a two cycle on the Pontryagin dual of gn, which is of course a quotient of z to the d, then the sister algebra of the Pontryagin dual of gn twisted by the two cycle sigma n and endowed with its quantum metric from the dual action converges in the sense of the dual propinquity to the quantum torus associated to the two cycle sigma and for its own quantum metric coming from the dual action and the same fixed length function on the d torus. We make a few comments about this result. First, note that if gn equals the d torus for every n, then this result tells us that the family of quantum tori is continuous with respect to the dual propinquity. Second, the special case of finite dimensional approximations of quantum tori by fuzzy tori, as found occasionally in the mathematical physics literature without a formal framework, can now be justified in this metric sense by choosing Gn as some finite subgroup of the d torus. Third, quantum tori are not AF algebras, as can be seen by computing their K1 group. So it is very interesting that we are actually able to approximate our quantum tori here by finite dimensional C-star algebras by using a metric notion. Fourth, for most choices of two cycles, quantum tori are simple and thus have no non-trivial quantum subspace, that is, quotients in analogy with the classical picture. This is an example where using a non commutative analog of Edwards Gromov Hausdorff distance is essential versus just a non commutative Hausdorff distance. In non commutative geometry, we will often be led to compare C star algebras, which are not related by one being a quotient of the other. A different family of examples of convergent sequences of quantum compact metric spaces is given by AF algebras. Let A be a unital sister algebra, which is the closure of the union of an increasing sequence AN of finite dimensional C star subalgebras of A. Let's assume, moreover, that A carries a faithful threshold state. Let's call that state tau. This state ensures the existence for every n of a conditional expectation from the C star algebra A onto AN. This conditional expectation is a unique conditional expectation which leaves the state tau invariant and we denote it by En. For all element A in our sister algebra, we define L of A as a supremum of the norm of A minus En of A divided by the inverse of the dimension of An, where n ranges over all natural numbers. As we saw in the previous lecture, A equipped with L become an example of a compact chronometric space. We now make some simple observations. Our AF algebra A is the inductive limit, in a categorical sense, of the sequence AN of finite dimensional C star subalgebras where the connecting maps are just inclusions. We now have defined a quantum metric on A. It is natural to ask whether A is also the limit of the sequence AN for the propinquity. This statement requires that we endow each AN with a quantum metric. This can be done by noting that the restriction of L to AN for every natural number N is again an L seminorm. We are then indeed able to prove that AL is the limit of the sequence ANL for the Gromov Hausdorff propinquity. Using similar techniques, it is possible to show that the natural map from the bare space to so called UHF algebras is actually a Lipschitz map. UHF algebras were introduced by Glim in the study of some problems from quantum statistical mechanics. They now form a natural copy of the bare space in the world of quantum compact metric spaces. Another interesting example 
of convergence for F algebras is given by the family of the f roche shen algebras. Those are the algebras that were later used by Pinsner and Voiculescu in their work on the classification of quantum tori. The construction is somewhat involved. Given an irrational number theta, we write theta as a limit of its expansion in continuous fractions. We then use the coefficients involved in the continuous fraction expansion to make an inductive limit of finite dimensional sister algebras. The inductive limit is called the Efron-Shen algebra for this irrational number theta. Efron-Shen algebras are AF algebras which admit a faithful threshold state. Thus, we can define a quantum metric on Efron-Shen algebras using the same techniques as on the previous slides. We were then able to prove that the function which to an irrational number associates its Efron-Shen algebra is actually a continuous function from the usual topology on the irrational numbers to the topology induced by the dual propinquity. There are many other examples of applications of the dual propinquity. For instance, Riffle constructed four metrics approximations for the dual propinquity of the sister algebra of complex valued continuous function on the two sphere using metrics arising from actions of SU2. His result is in fact valid to approximate any coadjoint orbit for a semi simple Lie group. We prove with Judith Packer the continuity of the family of the non commutative solenoids for the natural parametrization. We also proved that curved quantum tori of Dabrowski and Sittards form continuous families of quantum compact metric spaces for the dual propinquity. The same holds for conformal deformations of metric spectral triples. In a more theoretical direction, we showed that any nuclear quasi-diagonal compact quantum metric space is a limit of finite dimensional compact quantum metric space. And there are many more examples. We now turn to some of the topological properties of our new metric. Motivated by our own purpose for this metric, we in particular generalize Gromov compactness theorem. Gromov compactness theorem can be stated in terms of a concept called the covering number. Given a compact metric space X and an epsilon positive, how many balls of radius epsilon do we need to cover X? Finitely many by compactness. The minimal number of balls of radius epsilon needed to cover the space is then called the covering number of the space for that epsilon. Now, in non commutative geometry, as we have seen with the quantum tori, we do not have an obvious notion of what a ball inside of a quantum compact metric space is. While it could be tempting to use balls in the state space, since the state spaces equipped with the Morse contravention metrics are now genuine metric spaces, one needs to remember that we want to work within the category of sister algebras. And unfortunately, not every weak star closed convex subset of the state space is itself the state space of some other sister algebra. Such a result is not true. There are counterexamples. So this is not the right idea for our purpose. In order to stay within the sister algebraic framework, we propose the following definition of a covering number. It exemplifies the idea that by using the Gromov-Hausdorff construction, we can approximate spaces from the outside. So even if we do not have a good notion of a subobject, we can still talk about such things as covering numbers by defining the covering number of a quantum compact metric space A for an epsilon positive as a minimum of the dimension of a C-star algebra B, which can be equipped with a matrix such that the propinquity between A and B with their respective quantum metrics is no more than epsilon. Now that we have this notion of a covering number, we can prove the following. Let C be a class of compact quantum metric spaces with finite covering numbers. In other words, let C be a class of compact quantum metric spaces, which are all at least within some finite distance of a finite dimensional quantum compact metric space. The class C is pre-compact for the propinquity. That is, its closure is compact for the propinquity. If and only if, the following two properties hold. First of all, the diameters of all of the elements of the class C 
are uniformly bounded, where the diameter of a compact quantum metric space is simply defined as the diameter of its state space for the morse kontrovich metric. Second of all, there exists a function g from the positive numbers to the natural numbers, such that for any compact quantum metric space in our class C, the covering number of that space for epsilon is no more than the function g evaluated at epsilon. Again, it is a uniformity result. That is, we find a uniform estimate for all the covering numbers for a given epsilon of every element in our class C. This is really a direct analog of Gromov's theorem, but it involves new notions of non-commutative geometry, both the propinquity and a new notion of covering number. Let's see some applications of our compactness theorem. We have seen that the family of quantum tori is continuous for the dual propinquity. Using this observation in our compactness theorem, we can prove the following. Let d be a natural number which is neither 0 nor 1, and let's fix a continuous length function on the d torus. The quantum torus is, of course, the C-star algebra of Zd twisted by some 2 cycle. And we have seen how to endow such a quantum torus with an L seminorm using the dual action of the detorus and our chosen continuous length function. Now, if epsilon is strictly positive, our compactness theorem implies that there exists a natural number n such that for all possible 2 cycle theta of z to the d, the covering number of the quantum torus associated with theta for the positive number epsilon is less or equal than n. Thus n is a uniform bound on the covering number of all the quantum tori for this particular epsilon. Another application is a characterization of totally bounded classes of AF algebras carrying a faithful threshold state. We have seen how to equip such AF algebras with a quantum metric space structure. Now, our theorem characterizes totally bounded classes of such AF algebras, and that with our choice of an L seminar, as being exactly those AF algebras that are union of increasing sequence of finite dimensional C star subalgebras whose dimensions are uniformly bounded between two sequences of natural numbers. Again, we see a very natural form of uniformity arising from our compactness theorem for the dual propinquity. We thus have constructed a non-commutative analog of the edwards gromov hausdorff distance on classes of quantum compact metric spaces with a given Leibniz property. Our metric, the propinquity, is complete and is zero exactly between fully isometric quantum compact metric spaces. It induces the same topology as the edwards gromov hausdorff distance on the class of classical compact metric spaces. We showed several examples of convergent sequences of genuinely non-commutative compact quantum metric spaces constructed over important classes of C-sta algebras. We also showed that it is possible to use our framework to generalize some result from metric geometry to quantum metric spaces such as the Gromov Compactness Theorem. Our research direction has evolved toward applying our construction of the propinquity to other structures related to quantum compact metric spaces. For instance, we have developed a version of the propinquity for sister dynamical systems with appropriate metric data. We thus can discuss the convergence of time evolutions or symmetries in physics using our metric framework. We we'll also have a metric for modules of a quantum compact metric spaces. We can discuss the convergence of vector bundles and their non commutative analogues. And we prove that the Heisenberg modules of a quantum tori form continuous families for modular propinquity. Bringing together these ideas, we then constructed a distance on the class of metric spectral triples, thus enabling future discussions for the convergence of quantum analogues of Riemannian manifolds. Yet, more remain to be done. This new framework opened fascinating possibilities in the study of approximations of sister algebras by metric means, with potential applications 
mathematical physics. We include here a non-exhaustive list of publications related to this lecture.